It is Tuesday, October 1st, 2013. My name is Dale Tafoya, and this is another episode of Athletics Talk Now. We're a podcast and blog that celebrates the past and embraces the future of Oakland A's baseball. This is podcast number 120, and we want to welcome you, A's fans across the globe, listening on YouTube, Facebook, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and our website, athleticstalknow.com. On Twitter, you can reach me at, at Dale Tafoya. That's at D A L E. T-A-F-O-Y-A, and we'd like to welcome you. To find us on Facebook, we're at A's Talk Now, and be sure to like our Facebook page. And on iTunes, search Athletics Talk Now for an archive of over 100 podcasts. As I mentioned earlier, it's October 1st, and I want to wish former A's first baseman Mark McGuire a happy birthday. And as we get ready for Game 1 of the ALDS on Friday, who better to join us than an Oakland A's legendary pitcher, with a record of 8-0 in ALCS play. He was an all-star, a World Series MVP, and during the A's run in the late 80s and early 90s with all of those playoff games, did you know they never had a Game 7 in the postseason? But if they ever did, we would all know who'd get the ball. My guest, his name is Dave Stewart, and many, many A's fans still call him Stu. Stu, thanks for hanging out with us as your former team and hometown embraces postseason baseball oh man shoot it's nothing like it man this is the best time of year um, as far as the game is concerned um, all the teams are now um, done with their races and getting ready to, to figure out who's going to be um, the last two standing and I mean this is an exciting time for baseball this is an exciting time for age baseball during your postseason career Stu you, you've witnessed some iconic and some bittersweet moments for some A's fans in World Series history, starting with Kurt Gibson's walk-off homer off Eckersley in Game One of the '88 World Series, while you were with the A's, and while you were with you were a member of the Blue Jays in 1993, you saw the infamous Joe Carter walk-off World Series championship home run in the '93 World Series. Talk about those two moments, Stu. Well, I mean, both, as you said, one was bitter, the other was sweet. Um, and I just happened to be pitching in both of them. Um, you know, with the with the with the with the Kurt Gibson home run, obviously that was Game One in in the '88 series, and you know we had a we had a pretty good role uh, going up until that ball game. Um, we had uh, gotten through the the division, the league championship series, and, and um, you know that was Game One, and we were prepared and ready to play and. You know, the Dodgers struck first, and, and but you know, I was able to you know, gather myself and give our team a chance to, to get back in the game, which we were more than capable of doing with the offense, we had the players that we had, and you know, then we get into that ninth inning after pitching eight full innings and get into that ninth inning, and something that none of us expected was for one heck to to walk somebody, which. That was an unusual situation for Dennis. Um, I think Dennis probably only had four to four or five walks for the whole season, and you know he, um, he let 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 a guy get on with the walk, and and then um, you know the the, the Kurt Gibson um, home run, and that put us down. And you know I'm not too sure that we ever really recovered from that blow. Um, um, and as we did, we went on to lose that series, and. And then the Joe Carter, I mean, it was just an unbelievable situation. Once again, I started that game and threw the ball well. I got in trouble going into the seventh inning, and but left the game with the lead. And eventually, uh, the, the score um, went in favor of the Phillies. And you know, we got got into that situation, and you know, the right guy at the right time. Uh, at the plate, and to, to be frankly honest, we had the right guy on the mound for the Philadelphia Phillies um, uh, for that situation to happen with Mitch Williams, who he threw, threw his fair share of strikes, but um, overall was wild. And, um, you know, Joe being up in that situation um, got the pitch that he could drive, and, and we ended up winning that game in the last inning. And of course, Stu, you're, as we mentioned earlier, you were 8-0 and in ALCS play. How much did you prepare differently for a postseason start opposed to a start in the regular season? Um, I, I didn't. Um, if, if I'm being frankly honest, I, I really didn't. Um, you know, playing for Tony and playing for uh, Dave Duncan um, prepared me 
four situations like the postseason because what Dunk always said is you want to get yourself in the frame of mind that every game is a big game. You, you want to pitch every game as if though it's, it's, a, it's a big game. The problem is through 30 in, 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 in a full season, you know, making 37 and I think 35 to 37, maybe even 38 starts, you know, you, you're going to lose your fair share of games, whereas in a, in a, in a, in a short series, um, the, the likeliness of winning a baseball game, if your concentration and if everything goes well, you're going to win a baseball game. And so mental preparation was the same. Uh, the only thing that was different is the short series and um, the, the chance of, of winning, a, winning a game or losing a game. Obviously, it's 50-50, but um, because of the preparation during the course of the year, pitching against Clemens and Violas and the Finleys and the Jack Morrises and guys like that and, and making those game, big game situations that prepared me for the playoffs. Let's look at, at how the postseason is shaped uh, in this era, Stu. Of course, when you play for the A's, a team when a team won a division, they jumped right into the ALCS, which was the best of seven. Now there's the best of five ALDS to get to the ALCS and also a one-game one wild card. I mean, you could dominate the entire season, but your season hinges on winning three of the next five games. What are your thoughts, Stu, about this new playoff system? Oh, I'm not a big fan of it. I'm a, I'm a baseball purist. Um, you know, we can even go all the way back to 1981 when sure. when, you, when you won your division, uh, when you won your league, then you face the other, you face the East and the West would face each other, and whoever won, they won between those two, you go right to the World Series. We can go all the way back to that, and I'd be perfectly happy and love the game. Um, you know, with these different levels of, of playoffs, um, I, I think that it is definitely exciting for for the fans. I mean, and, you know, I come 56 years old, and probably the guys before me, when uh, we ended up with the league championship series, uh, were probably saying, "Man, it was better when when it was just a division series or a league series, and you play in the World Series." And it's just better for the fans now. We've got younger fans, and we're trying to get people more involved in the sports. We're trying to keep, keep, keep baseball the number one sport. And so by adding these different divisions, obviously we've had a little bit more excitement. And you, you talk to a thousand fans, they'll tell you that they may miss a hundred of the 60 of the 162 games that are played during the year, but they're glued to the TV when it's time for division and, and playoff and world series. Question for you via Twitter from Dario Rivera, Stu. Uh, Stu, were there any batters you had hesitations facing in the playoffs? Hesitation? <laughs> Stu, hesitation? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there, there's always there are always hitters that you that you have to respect, um, and that means anybody that comes up there with a bat, you got to you got to give them the respect of potentially being able to to do damage. But I don't think I was hesitant um, when anybody stepped to the plate. Um, I had a game plan um, that I stuck to pretty much for the 10 years of, of starting and the 16 years as a player. And, you know, it worked for me. So hesitation, no, but I did respect it. Right. Let's talk about home field advantage, Stu, in the World Series. Uh, back in the 80s and, and 90s, the NL and AL rotated each year. And now it was determined by who wins the All-Star game. Uh, just having fun, Stu, how much would home field advantage for the 88 A's have changed the results of the 88 World Series when you guys faced the Dodgers? Because the Dodgers had home field advantage that year. You know, I'm not, not really sure. I'm not sure if there would have been an advantage at all. Um, you know, it's tough to, tough to, to ask, ask God to replay the situation, if you know what I mean. Um, I, I would have to assume that, you know, I was still going to start game one, and I'd probably have to assume that maybe we'd be in that same situation. Um, and Eck would have made the same pitch in that situation. And Gibson, as he said a thousand times by their scout report, was told to, to expect that pitch in that situation. So I, I don't really know what the home field advantage would have been for us. It's, it's tough to replay it. Um 
and it really is. It, it, that's a difficult question to answer. When I think of your uh, performance in the postseason, Stu, many think about your do- dominance uh, of Roger Clemens. You know, sometimes I'll, I had Monty Poole, the great writer uh, uh, in the Bay Area, and I, I, I talked about your rivalry with, with Roger Clemens, and he stopped me and said, it wasn't a rivalry, it was a dominance. <laughs> So w- w- when I think about your dominance of Roger Clemens, thank you, Monty. Clemens was so dominant during that time, but you were his kryptonite. Did you guys like each other? Um, you know, I didn't really know him, uh, and, and uh, I very seldom had any personal sit-downs with Roger. I remember doing a, an interview in Boston on Nesson um, where um, – uh, the, the broadcasters from Boston had come to our dugout and asked me the day before if I would do a sit-down with Roger, and I said, I'll do one if he wants to If he wants to do one, and he agreed to do it, and we did a sit-down together, but that is the first and only time I can remember ever sitting in the same space with him. So when you asked did I like him, I didn't like um, what I saw from across the field. Um but I didn't really know the guy not to like him. But the truth is, I didn't like anybody that was in the other uniform. I didn't like the hitters, and I didn't like the opposing pitchers. Um, it was it was didn't mean one thing one way or another to me if I ever talked to these guys or if I ever met them. Um, it was difficult in the All Star game that I played to to even be in the same locker room with guys that in two days I was going to be seeing on the other side of the field. So. Um, I wasn't trying to make any friends in, in, in the sport other than my teammates, I guess is the best way to put it. And you pitched in a great deal of ballparks in the postseason, Stu. Fenway Park, the Sky Dome, Candlestick, Dodger Stadium, just to name a few. Was there a stadium that you got a little more pumped up for? Well, I really like going to Boston. Um, and the reason why I like going to Boston is because the fans there, they were difficult fans and um, in my opinion, not very nice fans. And so for me, uh, my theory when I went to when I went to Boston was, what can I do to take them out of the game? How can I get them out of the game? And wh- whoever it was that I'd be pitching against on the other side, I was going to let him finish that game. If anybody was going to finish that game, I'd be the guy to finish the game. And... Um, that's the Boston, probably of all the ballparks, I really got pumped up to, to pitch at. Question on, on Twitter for you, Stu, uh, from John English. Respect, respectively, Stu, of course, what on earth happened to the A's in the 1990 World Series against the Reds? <laughs> we, we came prepared to play, um, but we didn't execute. Um, and you know, I mean, that's that's what happens. If, if you don't execute, if you don't play the game the way it's supposed to be played, and you got to give respect to to the guys on the other side. I mean, Jose Rio, um, similar to to uh, Oral Hershiser in '88, and also people forget that Tim Belcher was a tough customer in 1988 for the Dodgers. I mean, but if you get one guy that's dominant. Um, it can change a series, uh, along with a good offensive ball club. Eric Davis, um, in 1990, Hatcher had a streak of, I think it was eight or nine straight hits. Um, Sabo played like he had never played before. I mean, that ball club, club came to play. Um, you look at their bullpen, they had the nasty boys down there, um, as you'll remember. And so it turned the game into a, a six-inning baseball game. So they were, they were not as much of a, a pushover club as probably the 88 Dodgers should have been. If anything, we felt really, really confident that um, the Dodgers were going to be a team that we should have walked over versus the 1990 Cincinnati team. That team was a good ball club. Um, they had some, some great pieces to challenge us and eventually beat us. Now, is it true that, that, that Jose Canseco, I know you're, you're, a, 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 you're a critic of his play during that series, that he, after the regular season, he would kind of be bothered that he had to play the postseason because he wanted to go back to Miami and sail on his boat and, and all that stuff. Yeah, he, he didn't want to be there. 
Um, and, and he made that publicly known in, in our clubhouse. He, he didn't want to be there. But, you know, we still tried to go about the business of, of playing the game, um, whether he wanted to be there or not. And the A's finished their season on Sunday, the 2013 A's, Stu, and they start the ALDS on Friday against the Tigers. Tigers. That's a four-day layoff. And I remember in 88, Stu, the A's cruised through the playoffs, swept Boston, while the Dodgers secured a playoff spot almost on the last day of the season. And the Dodgers go seven games with the Mets in the NLCS that year. The Dodgers were playing at, at a high level for weeks. Talk about what a layoff can do if you clinch too early, and what do you have to do to stay sharp as a team? Uh, I mean, for me, a layoff can be good and it can be bad. Um, if you've got guys that are beat up and banged up, uh, and I'll give you an example, the 1989 World Series, um, that was a long, long season for, for us in particular. We had a lot of guys that were beat up and banged up. I know that physically, and I was probably on my last, 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 last train. So we have the earthquake. We get a 10-day layoff. I mean, for me, that was a breath of fresh air. So, I mean, in, in regards to, you know, the layoff, it, it just depends on, on the, 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 the makeup and the, how, physically, how physically well your, your team is. If, you, if your team... Need days, I think that you know the layoff works to your advantage. Um, if your team is playing well, then you want to keep the momentum going. So it really works both ways. Hmm. And Stu, the A's are hosting a playoff rally in front of Oakland City Hall today at five o'clock. Game one of the ALDS on Friday is sold out, and the demand was so great, Stu, the A's had to take off the tarps from the third deck. Close to 50,000 fans will pack the Oakland Coliseum this Friday. You played in Oakland during, the, during postseason baseball. What kind of atmosphere do you anticipate there? And, and what would it mean, Stu, for the country to witness A's fans pack that stadium in Oakland? i got to tell you what, there's no better place to play um, than Oakland um, in the playoffs. With the packed house, it is an unbelievable feeling. It's, it's, a, it's a feeling that I can tell you personally I've never forgotten. Um, you know, taking the mound and hearing the fans chant school. I mean, it's, 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 there's just no bigger feeling. I know that there are some fan favorites now in that ball club. And um, probably during the course of the year, I shouldn't even say probably, I know during the course of the year that those kids going out on that field have never seen the stadium as packed as it's going to be through the playoffs. It's going to be electrifying. And, you know, knowing the makeup of that ball club, at least from, from a distance, watching them on TV and, and looking at what I think the makeup of that team is, those kids are going to be riding. They're going to be riding with, with that 10th with that, uh, stand. Mm. And, of course, uh, the 88 World Series comprised of the Dodgers, and A's, too. And I have to ask you, I know you're Matt Kemp's agent. <laughs> if the Dodgers and A's play in the World Series this year, who do you got? Uh, <laughs> I plead the fifth. <laughs> Come on, A's fans are listening. <laughs> Stu? <laughs> I plead the fifth on that one. I mean, I'm born and raised in Oakland, and so you know mm. it's going to be difficult for me to root against um, my home team. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, and it's, this is the unfortunate part. I mean, my my only real connection to the Oakland Oakland club is obviously my history with the team. But you know, Billy Bean was my teammate. Um, you got Kurt Young in, in the dugout as as a hidden guy. Ricky Rodriguez is there. Sure. Um, you know, I've got uh, Steve Houston at the clubhouse and Mikey Thoblum and all of the, the clubhouse guys that were there. And they were youngsters then and are now grown men. But my guys um, to the to the ball club, Mr. Dobbins by the clubhouse and all of the, the people that work security, those are the people that I know now. And I don't, I'm not really connected to the players on the field. But my sentiment in my heart is always going to be with the hometown. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you were born in Oakland. Is it tough maybe um, dealing with, uh, with an ownership, Stu, and, and trying to connect with an ownership that wants to take – the team from your hometown and move it to San Jose is that 
Does that weigh in the relationship at all, Stu? Yeah, it does. I mean, I'm, I'm a traditional guy, and I think I said that before. Sure. I mean, when you look at the 72, 73, and 74 Oakland A's teams, you know, and though we didn't win in 88, 89, and 90, we were there three straight years. And those were the golden days, in my opinion, of the Oakland A's. And, and the tradition of that franchise is in Oakland. And so, yeah, it is. It's difficult for me to, to, to tie myself to, to ownership when you want to move a club that traditionally um, is Oakland. And, and, and I think taking that ball club out of the city is going to be detrimental to the city of Oakland. So it's not just the ball club, but it's also my home. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and Stu, I, I, I texted you this a few weeks back, and I just wanted to, and many fans are dying, especially in Oakland, for a new ballpark in Oakland and, and a, a, a Dave Stewart's pub, a Ricky Henderson Lane, a, a, a X tavern uh, just a, a, a downtown ballpark that would be full of ace history, and I think many fans uh, are excited about that possibility. Well, i, I got to tell you, uh, you know, if all things work, as they're supposed to, uh, that ball club will stay in Oakland. Mm. That's Dave Stewart. I'm Dale Tafoya. Thanks for listening, Ace fans. And, and Stu, thanks for always taking the time, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, taking the time to give back to the Ace fan base. Thank you so much.